that too over nice. there. Is that too Good. out of our tether? Or is Hello that straight Thank again? you. Uh, like this. The one the lasers are on now? Yep, yep, just about. Yeah, that one? Yep. Looks like it might be loose. Looks like it might be a little angular. Let me just stop mm -hmm. the ship. Or do you want to, you really want to try them on the fly? Um, if you think it's just to like grab it and chuck it in the bio box and you could do that on the fly, that's great. If Come down a little bit, Sarah. I don't want to stop the ship, so if okay. if it's a matter of that, then we'll just wait till this before the next move. Is really right in the way. Really dangerous. Is there a reason the rock has to be angular? Yeah, the, our hope is that if it's angular, that means it's not too encrusted, that you're maybe still seeing the underlying shape of the actual rock rather than it being something that used to be a rock but now is has been totally altered and is just like a ball of crust and altered contents. <laughs> Getting in real close there. Yeah. He's got it. Oh, stop. Yeah, Box perfect. Out. Uh, uh, if we could do a sp spin pictures of it before we stow it, and then, uh, yeah, we'll put it in starboard somewhere. Okay, can it go in the toolbox or no? Toolbox, like porch box. Front, um, the front one. I feel like we don't, do we have Do we have the, the plexiglass in there right now? We don't really want to scratch those up with rocks, right? Okay. Hey, let me know when you go with the imaging. That's good, thank you. Okay, and... Okay, so now you can okay. start to write and Sorry, there I need that the arm in the bubble cam. And then I need... I need this. I need to write the other bio camera in the box out. Okay, box out. And that can go into, uh, it can go into E, that's fine. E, is this E? Yep. Bridge nav. Great, thank you. Yep. Oh, get out of there. Nice catch. Uh, let's do another two zero meters at zero three five degrees and point two knots. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> so we can just carry on as we were before. Thank you for the flyby sample. Good. And that nav was NA149-011, so you can drop a target in high pack. Oh.
Well, gone out of the shot. Super frustrating because you try and get back. And you don't want to back up if I don't want to, but like, you get like this. See, and as as I'm turning around, I'm shortening the tether, right? <laughs> so it's like uh, back up. So if you're just tuning in, welcome aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus. We are here today out in the north northwest area of the Kingman Reef. Yeah, I'm going to get her to stop next time. It's just trouble. Going to get them to stop next time. It's just troublesome. They're going to rush everything. So this is an area of... United States territory that is part of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. I think we're still outside of the monument right now. Still in the EEZ, would you say? EEZ, yes, we are. And EEZ stands for Exclusive Economic Zone. And that is a boundary that is 200 miles off the coast of any territorial land owned by a country. And we are currently are about Just, two thousand. Uh, stop the ship, will you uh, please? We're way out of position here. Can you say that again? Stop the ship, please. Uh, yes. Uh, bridge nav. Uh, let's hold position here, please. Thank you. And... So we are currently trying to reorient our ROVs right now. We are about 2,585 meters below the ocean surface. We are currently exploring an unnamed guillot. Most of these waters have been uncharted, so what we are doing <laughs> is important work to discover what lies below the ocean surface. I'll also just chime in really quick. If any of you were um, here to see the floating um, Holothurian that came along a bit ago. It looks like it was an Elpididae um, or a sea pig. So yeah, just wanted to clarify that. Thanks for the research. So as a all reminder, Cheyenne, that was sample NA one four nine dash zero one one. Dash uh zero. Okay, you can start the ship again. Yeah. Yeah. So I do underscore. I don't think I might Oh. And then we do um and then notes here. Um what it was. So if it was like a rock grab or a missile or whatever. Awesome. Okay, uh, come down a bit, Sarah. We're pretty high here. Mm -hmm. Try and get back on the wall there. Mm -hmm. 
No, we are not, not leaving bottom. They're going back down to the bottom now. <laughs> All good ROV wise, Michael? Uh, almost. Okay. Yeah, you don't really save anything doing that. That is just lens flare up there, I think, isn't it? Better be. <laughs> Okay, start the ship going again. All what a racket. Right. Okay, you can write that. Bridge now. And then, Sarah, come down a little bit. Uh, let's do another two zero meters at zero three five and point two knots. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, come down, keep coming down. No. What's going on there? Okay. All right, that's good on the down, Sarah. Let me try and get a bit lower here. I don't like the way that Tether's whipping around. Yeah. 
hair. God. All right. Um, ROV pilots, would you be good with moving uh, directly west 270? Uh, uh, okay. Um, yeah, we're already facing west. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, I see what's going on. Maybe um, bring the camera down a little bit. Sarah, I'll come a little bit closer. Yeah, like that. Maybe Bridge try nav. that. That'll be better. Um, can we do two we zero meters at two seven zero degrees and point two knots? Yes, please. Thank you. So if you are all just tuning in again, welcome aboard the Exploration Vessel Nautilus. We have had quite the expedition so far. We are currently about 2,620 meters below the ocean surface, below an area of the ocean that's called the Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atolls. We are just right outside that area, exploring an unnamed geo. And this is in U.S. territorial waters, which is part of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. And we'd like to talk to you about some things that we have found on this expedition. This includes a So far on our expedition, we've come across many interesting sea creatures. Yesterday, we came across a shark as well as a mysterious organism. You can find this on our YouTube channel. Looks like a minesweeper protus of some sort. Video watch change. And on this watch, we've also come across a few sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers, excuse me. Crinoids, corals of all sorts, and sponges. And during this watch, feel free to ask any questions that you feel on our website. And we'll have our team of scientists and engineers here to help answer any questions you have. And for this next watch, I'll be turning it over to our next SPL. And her name is Katie, and you all have a lot of fun with her. Who is it? <laughs> it's like he's like creeping around down there.
Hello, everybody listening on SPL land. We are right in the middle of a shift change. Uh, I am Katie Doyle, a Science Communication Fellow, SCF, aboard EV Nautilus. Thank you all guys for tuning in as we are exploring an unknown guillot uh, just northwest of the Kingman Palmyra um, Atoll and Reef, which are part of the Mar Remote Pacific Marine National Monument. Hello everyone. This is Daryl doing a video check. Hello guys and welcome. Mario sounding good? That is amazing. Hello everybody, we're just finishing up a watch change, so if you'll just hang tight for another moment or two while we finish tra transitioning the team here in the van, we'll get back to exploration in just a second. So I have to say to everybody that was watching last night at the same time, we had a fantastic shift filled with a shark, a possible Dumbo octopus egg case, and our absolute favorite, which is now on YouTube and the new Nautilus website. Uh, what we thought was a mysterious orb, then we thought was a Pokemon, then we thought was possibly a Minesweeper character, actually turned out to be a type of protist. The exact name for that guy if you don't want to watch the YouTube video. 
is something that is extremely hard to pronounce. But I've got to I double check the you. pronouncing. Mm -hmm. So the mysterious orb from last night is actually a type of protus. And forgive me for butchering this pronunciation, but Tuscaridium cyginium. So you can watch, you can see that video. It just got put up recently. Uh, it's on YouTube. It's on the Nautilus website. Go take a look at our fantastic mysterious orb that's we've now been able to identify. So one mystery gone, but still just as cool. Test one two. Perfect. So we are down at a depth a, of about 2,600 meters, a little bit overboard, or a little bit over that. And as I said earlier, we're right in the middle of a shift change, so we're just about to get started again. But you can some, see some beautiful sand right there at the bottom. Good to go. All right. So as people are switching over, I would like to toss out a round of introductions. So if anybody that is ready to go is wanting to say who they are, what their role on board the Nautilus is, and just a little bit about their background. So I can go first. My name is Katie. I am a science communication fellow. I am from Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, live about a mile from the Gulf of Mexico, which as you listen to me, you will find out I have a deep love for the Gulf of Mexico. So I'm gonna to toss it over to Coralie. Hi everyone, uh, this is Coralie Rodriguez. I am a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. I'm a scientist here aboard and I study geological oceanography and more specifically, I study the geochemistry of ferromanganese crusts, which we don't see any right now. You just see a bunch of sand, <laughs> but um, eventually- We saw a lot earlier. Yeah, we saw a lot earlier. We'll see a lot as we go on, um, but yeah. Thanks, Corley. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is Brian Kennedy. I will be your watch lead for the next four hours for the most part. I'm a deep sea benthic ecologist uh, with the Ocean Discovery League and Boston University. Uh, and I'm looking forward to exploring with you for the next couple hours. So we're sitting here in the sand patch right now on a little local kind of flat er area. Uh, and then we're going to start moving due west up the local incline here. We're um, struggling a bit with the weather today. Um, our, the line up of where the bathymetry we want to be going up uh, is not cooperating with where the wind and the current are pushing the ship. So we're having to uh, steal a little uh, um, strategy from the sailing world and tack back and forth uh, across the seafloor here to keep the ship motion um, lined up in a happy way with the elements for the day. That was a really great summation of what, what we are doing right now and about you. Thanks, Brian. No problem. Uh, hello, I'm Chris. I'm a data logger here on the Nautilus. I'm from Seattle, Washington. And uh, when I'm not here, I work for the Nature Conservancy managing the, the research station on Palmyra Atoll. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Daryl, I know you are doing some stuff. Would you have a moment to do uh, an introduction? If not, that's perfectly all right. I'm good. Well, hello there. I'm Daryl, the video intern. If you want to say uh, a little bit about your background or a little bit about yourself or even what you're doing right now. Right now, I'm currently adjusting the volume for everyone's voice so that we sound good. I'm a live video guy. I handle a lot of live video production and uh, videos. I enjoy handling uh, cameras and give photography, all that fun stuff. Currently, I'm handing, handling sound for us. <laughs> Which we greatly appreciate, so we sound great, especially on uh, YouTube videos about Protus. Yes. Thanks, Daryl. Yep. Lynette, would you have a moment to introduce yourself? Or Dan? Point three seconds ago. Uh, sorry, we were offline there. We're chasing a AC ground fault up here. 
but I think I heard you in the background. <laughs> I have a voice that carries right. both good and bad. So would you have a moment to introduce yourself? And if not, 100% okay? Yeah, I'm Dan. I'm sitting in the Hurt chair tonight. And uh, I don't know what else to say. I have a red light in front of me, an AC ground fault. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, it could be. Oh, no. Uh, can I ask you, so why is it that I keep getting a whole bunch of comments about Delta Dan flies again and Delta Dan? Uh, you'll find out. If we ever get around a cliff or a rock out of this uh, really exciting sand patch. <laughs> so no update. So for those of you who were watching yesterday when we were up on the top of a similar right. feature, uh, a guillot about uh, 50 miles north of here, you we would we're talking about the bed forms of the sand channels and how they were lined up in a parallel fashion. If you look at the sand here, we're looking at you can kind of see two different directions almost at 90 degree angles at them in the pattern, um, um, which means that the current here is more variable off, or, um, or maybe just has two different directions of travel, but you get this more varied bed form thrusters. shape here that allows us to kind of infer a little bit about the currents in this area, uh, and it contrasts from what we saw yesterday. Um, uh, we had kind of a single direction of the too. current that was probably a little bit stronger given that the waves, the sand waves were um, bigger. So all those different currents, as we're seeing in the bed form formation, is making it a little bit more of an interesting challenge for our nav and our ROV team. Okay. Whew. <laughs> um, that's good. That means we don't have to recover the vehicles. Um, you can turn all your lights back on and then watch that alarm page again and uh, when you get an update. So what's happening there is um, <coughs> the ground fault detect system kind of cycles through all the circuits. And if there's a big change in the... Uh, it's a characteristic of the bender, what we use for the ground fault detection system. <coughs> so if there's a big change in the uh, ground fault, it will take longer for it to update. I'm going to tilt up on your camera just a bit while you're madly writing there. Now I got it. <coughs> um, let's turn on one thruster, dealer's choice, and then engage auto heading and see what happens. And then uh, bring your heading back around to the right. Uh, look to the west. Is that really where I am, Lynette? I, I came all the way south there, did I? I drifted to the south, did I? Hmm. How'd I do that? all these lights I was confused I was blinded I know I did it look there's a rock in the middle of the desert could be an oasis so for those of you who are watching at home you're, you're you've got your quad feed you've got your Atalanta view and you've got your Herc view um, but here in the control room we have numerous other screens different situational cameras on the vehicles we have all kinds of different computer screens, so we've got a whole bunch of situational awareness tools here in the van um, that due to bandwidth constraints, we can't get you all on shore. But we're kind of continuously bouncing around, looking at different things from the forward-looking sonars on can both vehicles, up, uh, um, the tether cameras on both meters. vehicles that look aft so we can check the health of the tethers and make sure the lift lines are still solid. We've got cameras in the control room looking at different gauges on the vehicle, analog gauges on the vehicle to double check the digital readouts. Um, I'm sitting here back in the row. I've got three computer screens up that I'm actively using and each of them is split into two screens. So I've got four active windows of information well, we're gonna plus 
uh, another repeater of the Herc screen. The now, so and then to... my colleague Chris next to me has a couple other screens up that I'm Keep cheating and stealing clip, um, views over his shoulder. I'm looking at the vehicle navigation and the pilot control screen. Um, all of these different ways yep. of you know, feeding us different types of information is how we maintain the situational yeah, awareness of it. I know what's what happening the at the bottom of the seafloor. Um, so I get a sense of, from the science point of view, of what the terrain is like uh, around here that might have provide some Can context and insights anywhere? into the life we're seeing. Uh, and then the pilots and the operations team in the front row can keep the vehicle safe while doing the science. So it is just a sea of computer mm. screens in here, and we rely on people like yeah, Daryl and Dave over here in the that. video so chair in the corner north right to now. keep all Trank. those screens, you're video channels, and stuff second. flowing um, so we can do the science safely. Uh, and the video engineers are in some ways the unsung heroes of this uh, and control van. We hear about the pilots, we talk to the scientists, and the video engineers, and they're all black over there hiding in the corner, trying not to be noticed, <laughs> doing their job ex exceedingly well. Yeah, we can. You can put in some longer moves if you want. Keep them. Keep them moving. The start-stop is really painful at the steps. <coughs> keep the ball rolling. We'll get there. Oh, so there might be some possible life out here, like Dan said, on this oasis of rocks. Yeah, well, we weren't thruster enabled. That's why. So last night was such an epic high of a wash, possible Dumbo octopus egg case, the giant protozoan, so many corals. So it looks like, Ren, that we have a hard ground fault on the aft thruster. That should be on a separate page there for the... <coughs> Uh, for the list for this dive. Yeah, the defects page, that's it. Sorry about that, guys. We had a technical uh, issues here, but I think we got it sorted out. No worries, safety yeah. first. Dan, would you be able to tell us a little bit uh, about what you were just talking about, about the ground fault and how you're troubleshooting it? Yeah, one of the uh, issues we have with putting uh, high voltage in salt water is uh, cables and connectors keeping the uh, salt water out. So there's specialized underwater connectors. And um, There's a whole, uh, what's the word I want? Sorry, I'm... No, 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 you're trying to talk and <laughs> pilot an ROV and talk to NAV. Uh, we, so we treat the connectors uh, basically with silicone when, when they're mated and they make a rubber to rubber seal for the most part. Um, but a lot of the connectors are uh, they're used quite often, so kind of like an old clamp plug that you have that doesn't stay in the wall anymore. They get, <laughs> they get uh, worn out. And uh, we replace them all the time. We replace cables, so they're also, they're dealing with, uh, in addition to, you know, just being in salt water at depth, they get, they pressure cycle. And uh, it's not uncommon for us to, to have uh, ground fault issues at depth. So what's happening is the connectors, uh, got a little seawater in it and it's shorting out and a lot of times that's not a big deal most of our stuff is 24 volts but it can um, damage the uh, not only the connector but in some cases like in this case there's a bulkhead connector into our one atmosphere sealed bottle and um, to change that out is not trivial we have to you know remove the remove the brain from atlanta Ooh and uh, get in there and fiddle around with little wires and stuff. So was there something that you did to
troubleshoot or to fix that ground fault connection or is it you're just like okay we'll fix it when it gets back up no so our monitoring system um it kind of it goes around and it checks all the connectors so it it puts uh, we have a device on both the vehicles that puts a voltage onto those um connectors and cables and it tests to see if it has uh leakage to ground it works a lot like your um uh, RCD, RCD device or your uh, ground fault detector that you have typically like in the bathroom or in the kitchen next to the sink. So in the case of those, you know, if you accidentally drop your hair dryer into the uh, bathtub, it shuts the, shuts the power off. In our case, we get an alarm here on the uh, graphical user interface, but it doesn't tell us exactly which circuit is... Uh, is giving us a fault, so we have to cycle through and turn things off. So in this case, uh, what we did, uh, we turned off all the lights. Those are 110 volt powered, and um, then we, and then we have to wait because the uh, it has to cycle through the circuit before it updates. And uh, that wasn't it. We still had the fault. So then we turned off the thrusters on Atalanta, which kind of it's kind of hard to control Atalanta when the thrusters are turned off. Yeah. But uh, that's why we lost uh, sight of Hercules there, kind of. Well, right now, that's a gorgeous shot. Yeah, so in the end, we determined that, so there's two thrusters on Atalanta that control the heading. So uh, Ren can maintain these beautiful shots, and and I can see where I'm going. And obviously, we use that to uh, see upcoming terrain and uh, geology and biology, and we can kind of divert on the path a little, like I'm kind of sliding to the right right now, so looks more interesting. Ooh, what are, are those crinoids? Those yep, are those are stalked crinoids. A uh, really, really anxious, ancient lineage. They have been more or less unchanged in the fossil records for over 100 million years. Actually, That's for a long, long time, time, they were thought extinct until yeah, we started say. to do this type of work and realized that they were still very much alive and well. But they're only found currently in the deep sea. Yep. So, so I remember you were talking yesterday about so many times we think a creature is extinct and then we explore some part of the deep sea and or we talk to uh, local indigenous cultures and we find out, no, it's it's not extinct after all. Pilot, if you're good, can we take a look at the stocky thing dead center? <laughs> stocky thing dead center, Roger. Thank you. So is there any note in there of them um, adjusting the ballast? We still have our full complement on board. That looks like just a stick. I can uh, push in there if you want, Daryl. Is that eyeballs? Is it a stick? So we've got a little crinoid here on the left in the yellow, and we've got a little xenophyophore here on the right. I still don't have a good read on what the linear elongated feature is. You can uh, push in a little it is, more. Oh, it is likely a crinoid, a dead crinoid stalk, I believe. Oh. Yep. See oh. those ring patterns right around the end? Um, that's probably a crinoid stalk. Um, What's that? And, all right, great pilot. We're good here. Thank you. All right. So these xenophyophores you see here, there's now two or and three the of them. And the xenophyophore is the right one? The kind of, yeah, the kind of almost scallopy looking thing um, with a stalk. Uh -huh. um, they are a single cell, basically amoeba. amoeba. Whoa. Um, and they are the biggest uh, single celled organisms that I'm aware of. Uh, I won't go as far as they anywhere, but I don't know of anything bigger. And they're really kind of a nifty, really understudied um, organism for how common Push they are in the deep sea. a little more there if you want. There. So the real common in the deep sea, are, is that kind of only where they're found? Are they found on land or shallow water? I am only aware of them in the deep sea. Um, 
<coughs> generally the limits on single cell organisms a lot of time are diffusion and being able to oh. move gas across their cell membranes. And so being in the deep sea, uh, the colder temperatures and things like that help with some of the basic physical processes that allow them to get so big. And it looks just kind of like a gray mushroom. Yeah, pretty much a lot. You see them in three or four different morphologies or different types of shapes. All right, Dan, I think we are, can move on up the hill. Okay. <coughs> So would that guy have, or would that creature have a single nucleus, or would it be multi-nucleate? Go, uh, go ahead, Forster. I am gonna defer to looking that one up later. Uh, I don't remember because some of these large multi, uh, some large single-cell organisms uh, will have multiple nuclei. Um, hold hold your head in there. This is one of them. I'm not gonna slide over in front of you. That's one of my fun little microscope tests that I give sixth graders: is give them a paramecium one with a single nucleus and the other one with a multiple nucleus or nuclei. How many can you count? What's the difference? Yeah. Good crinoid, no, so dead, dead sponge stock there, maybe a Ferrea sponge. That is oh. definitely dead up in the top left. Coraline, what is this? I, I think there's a, a specific name for the texture on the manganese crust here, but I can't remember what it is. Can you do remember? Botryoidal. That's right. Yeah, so uh, botryoidal is a term that we use in geology to describe okay. this very... You can, uh, oh, can we look at that coral that's come, just come going up down? Five. Oh, no. Bumpy texture. And uh, bring our head 10 degrees to the right as well. Roger that. And that's the type of rock we're looking at or just the surface of the rock? It's the type of texture, so you'd use it. To, there's okay, different words you can use there, to describe the texture of a rock, and it being so bumpy, you would just call yep. it botryoidal. Ooh. All right, we've been debating what this was all this dive, and there's been a discussion about whether it's a species of chrysogorgid or a type of bamboo. Uh, I am leaning towards a type of chrysogorgid. Um, so if it was a bamboo, it would have... It would have nodes, right? In theory, yep. Yeah, one of the the defining diagnostic criteria for a bamboo is this? black stripes around it or nodes. Um, and we have not, you can kind of see a pattern in the skeleton here. I can't really see it here, but I definitely saw it earlier. But it wasn't fully black and it wasn't consistent. And the polyp structure here, these kind of dainty looking polyps all facing a similar direction with long arms make, make it feel much more chrysogorgid-esque to me. Okay, there we we'll go. So we have some online geologists, Corley, who are telling me the spelling. Botryoidal, <laughs> yeah. I love it. It's an interesting, an interesting spelling. I was going to say science is not the best at fun spellings. No. <laughs> So those of you who are watching uh, last night with us, I am saddened to report that we did not recover the two coralivorous jellyfish we attempted to get. They somehow escaped. Um, but we changed the mess size and made some modifications to the slurps um, to give us a higher likelihood of success next time we, go, we find one. So uh, <coughs> let's keep that delta. Uh, Double digits. Uh, the weather is a bit extreme now, so you're mm. really close to. Uh, if we take a big heave, you'll hit the seabed there, <coughs> and I'm letting you get pretty close to me. So. So, Brian, one of the questions that we have online yeah, is... keep the digits, uh, double digits there. Just around, just around 10 is fine. Is dozen organisms makeup become more or less complex with sea depth? Sorry, say that again? Yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, dozen organisms makeup become more or less complex? Because it seems to a couple of our online viewers that as the depth increases, the body plan might become more simplified or more utilitarian. That was a that was a hard question. <laughs> I gotta think that one through. Um, 
So online viewer, you have stumped Brian for just a moment, though. No, he stumped, he stumped me good because I'm I don't have a I don't have an answer, like a well-researched answer at all to give. If I'm a kind of spitball, I would say things are a little more um, simple in terms of physical structure, but maybe more complex in some ways in terms to biochemical structure. So they have interesting biochemistries that allow them to deal. Are you with, changing your heading or am um, I pulling you? The um, pressures. Um, but yeah, certain things like keep fish, uh, swim bladders mm -hmm. become very hard to maintain. But they, so I'll they trade them the out box. for more oily skins or oil sacks and stuff like that to compensate for the depth. Uh, um, if but we do yeah, change the heading, in a lot of ways, let me know. The, some of the body plans do seem so to be simplified. You I'm see using your heading on a lot of different um, types of um, and your sonar. So um, the heading you were on uh, previously, stuff, but part you were of that looking also might up the hill trying to live in a, an environment with and I'm watching lower your in so terms of food availability. So they're so just kind of more streamlined the, the um, to deal with there. less food intake or scarcity. So they expend less energy both so in motion it, and in growing because um, food is so, so hard to come by. And they may eat you know, very, very infrequently. That was an excellent explanation. Thank you. But that was a really good question. And now yeah. I, I, I can truly say I'm going to ponder that one. Um, some more. So thank you to our online community. Sometimes we're not able to get to your questions or comments right away, but we do enjoy that y'all guys are writing in, asking questions. So thank y'all to our online viewers. So if anyone in the van sees a I don't even know what to call it. It's a snail, but uh, some kind of spherical mass in the center of the mouth of the crinoid. Shout out. There's a really cool parasitism where mm. a snail climbs up the um, stalk of these crinoids, sticks its uh, feeding appendages in the mouth of the crinoid, and literally eats the food right out of the mouth of the crinoid. Uh, and it's one of those things, it's an, it's an association that's seen in the fossil record forever um, that we see almost exactly the same uh, here and it's only was really documented live uh, a few years ago actually in this part of the world was the first time it was seen I forget if it was Palmyra or Jarvis but it was in the line islands was the first time that it had been seen um, occurring uh, live in modern times so we'll I haven't all seen keep it our yet, eyes peeled. But just an interesting thing to keep watching in an area with so many different crinoids well Brian I think I told you before but I am extremely lucky when it comes to ocean stuff. Excellent. So I have a feeling we're going to find it. Maybe not tonight, but during this expedition. So Dan, can you explain to our online viewers, because I get this question a lot, why are we using Atalanta instead of Argus right now? Um, primarily because we're <coughs> in uh, deeper water here and uh, the weather is typically a bit on the marginal side. So the weight of Atalanta is uh, significantly less than Argus. So right now we're at, I don't know, how deep are we? 2,500 meters and we have um, 8,000 pounds on that overboarding sheave on the A-frame on the back. Mm -hmm. And um, that's bouncing around, as you can see on the green graph here in front of Wren. Mm -hmm. um, if Argus was on there right now, we'd be up probably in the 12,000 pound range. So would that be enough to possibly snap a wire? Uh, no, we would never let it go to that extreme. Uh, it has have had that happen uh, in the commercial world where, where we push the envelope a lot harder. Uh, but the the concern is more for the uh, loading on the A-frame. So the A-frame has a certain rating, the overboarding sheave has a certain rating. And uh, we, we have, you know, uh, safety factor numbers that we don't want to exceed. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we had Argus, we would probably be, it would 
limit our weather window a little bit more. So Atlanta opens the weather window a bit more. It's not as heavy, so it's not uh, stressing the A-frame and the cable. But Argus is on the back deck. Is there a time during this expedition that you foresee possibly using Argus? Touch wood, hopefully not. Uh, Argus is there in case uh, we have a catastrophic failure with Atalanta and we have to, you know, it's basically a spare vehicle. Gotcha. And we kind of miss it. It has a really cool cutout on the front that says Argus. I go lift the <laughs> tarp once in a while, have a look, just to make sure it's not getting lonely. <laughs> We also have little Hercules on board, which was actually my first ROV. Ooh, can we check out the sponge, please? Ooh. Really? Yeah, we had uh, we had little Hercules out on Okeanos Explorer in 2010 for my first deep sea ocean exploration project in Indonesia, and little Herc was our primary vehicle. So when I got on board last week and saw little Herc, it was like a reunion. Go ahead, Daryl. You can push in there. Did you take a whole bunch of selfies with it? I did not this time, but I would certainly will before I leave. I am, my sponge idea is terrible, so I am not sure what this is. It's some type of glass sponge or, sponge or hexactinellid. And uh, push in a little tighter there. Um, and this is one of those ones where we'll get a good shot of it, and then when we're annotating the video, we'll sit down and actually key it out with a whole bunch of different pictures of different sponges in the area, but I'm not even going to venture a guess Maybe on this one. Push in just a little more and open the iris so just Ooh. a tad. get the osculum there you want to see the osculum or the yeah uh, the osculum would be great and if we could just get a little bit of a focus on the structure of the um the pattern nice. of the crystalline structure i know it's not quite in the light pool good for that but that's okay that's probably good enough i can play with the lights if you want no there. i don't think we need to spend that much time on it and i think i'm good thank you okay you can go away thank you so this must be so hard to identify sponges, because I know the easiest way, but also like the, the hardest way is to identify them by their spicules. And down here, you can't really take a sample of every sponge and look at the spicules. Correct. Um, so that is, it is one of the good ways. It's called a bleach prep, generally, is we take the, take the sponge and then we use um, just household bleach um, and dissolve a lot of the silicate structures off of it in the thinner ones and that it reveals the spicules and then if it's a big spicule one a, a standard light microscope is fine if it's a small spicule one you may have to even do some scanning electron microscopy um, to really figure out what it is uh, and that is has a significant portion of art as well as science is interpreting the spicules because they one can have multiples oh there's our first Ooh. purple sea cucumber of the day that I've seen. Push in on the sea cucumber. They're always popular. So these are holothurians. Uh, it's actually a type of echinoderm. Um, and they are detritivores. So they just kind of crawl around the seafloor and slurp up sediment and digest the meofauna and the bacteria um, that are living on the sediment and leave a trail of cleaner sediment behind them. Um, they can kind of come in two flavors. We have the ones that <laughs> are on the bottom all the time uh, like this one they will sometimes jump up and do a very pretty but very ineffectual swimming motion occasionally to try and get away uh, and then you have the ones that actually are pretty good at swimming all the way to Try the platyphurias that there spend their want. entire life pretty much in the water column only landing to collect settlement and then take off again no not is it me or is it not quite focused Ooh. That's better, thank you. It's almost like he's waving to us. Yeah, I suspect that's a little bit of thruster wash from the vehicle that's disturbing him right now. <laughs> I like my theory. He's <laughs> waving at us, he's saying hello. Take my photo, guys. Maybe he's doing sunset hard hands in his own way. All right, science is good. Off we go. Thanks, Daryl. So whenever I have a bad day, I like to think of the cucumber. I think I told one or two of y'all guys this, like, his whole job is to eat dirt, eat dead stuff, eat detritus, and the world is a better place for him. So, no matter
matter how bad my day is, I just think about that and I'm like, all right, I'm doing all right in life. <laughs> So Dan, if uh, Argus is on board as a spare for Atalanta right now, is there the possibility of Little Hurt being used later on this expedition? There's always a possibility. <laughs> that is above my pay grade. There you go, asking questions none of us want to go on record saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's certain bad luck associated with statements around of that type. We're not superstitious, but it doesn't hurt to be safe. Exactly. And as a whole, as a lot, the people that go to seas tend to be a little bit more superstitious than the average. 100%. One of the ships I used to sail on had a very elaborate witch roll where we would sacrifice gummy bears at the <laughs> beginning of a cruise for good luck, but we weren't superstitious. <laughs> So a viewer said that the sponge earlier was a polyopogo... Popagon? Yep. That's definitely possible. Yep. Okay, Ren, you ready for some technical stuff? Um, select uh, H11 as your destination. And select uh, Argus Zeus, I think, as your... Uh, source. Yes, sir. Sled Zeus, that's what you want. There you go. Tired of looking at those gauges there. So we're meant to look here, not break our necks all night looking up at those top screens. I still have the gauges. Is that a brittle star on a crinoid stock? Yeah, it's a brittle star on some kind of stock. I'm not sure what it is, but we're not going to be able to tell much. It's just a brittle star that lost part of its home or just couldn't find a good coral. Aww. So it climbed up the only high thing it could find. I'm sorry, homeless brittle star. Can you turn off uh, Atlantis aft light? It's the one that's shining in my eye right there. Not sure what circuit it's on. Maybe circuit one. You'll have to cycle through. So we have another hard-hitting Brian question. One half second. Can we take yes. a look at the little branchy thing coming straight down above the lasers, please? Right here. All right, what's your question? Okay, so. Oh, I'm not seeing it yet. Uh, it is just coming off the top of the screen dead center. Oh, now. I see it, I see it. Thank you. Oh, I got a telestrator. I got it used to having the telestrator. Yeah. <laughs> a superpower that I've always wanted in a control room, and now I'm forgetting to use it now that I have it. <laughs> yep. With great power okay, comes great responsibility. push right in a little more. Let's just keep the lasers in for him so I can get the scan. Yep. So this is a very, very sad looking bamboo coral. It has seen better days, but you see that one black ring right above the three-way branching node. Okay, you can push in a little more a now. Of, so this is a nodal brancher. You can see that the branches grow all right associated with the black stripes. Uh, and that is one of the diagnostic criteria you can use for helping to identify what genera um, this organism belongs to. And as you can see, it's got a lot of dead tissue on it. The areas where there aren't polyps or that's discolored, looks like it's lost several branches. Um, this coral is definitely not in good shape. All right, science is done. Thank you. Roger. Okay, Daryl, go wide, please. Did we like cross the metaphorical railroad tracks over here? Like we're on the wrong side of the tracks right now. Got a homeless <laughs> brittle star, a sad bamboo coral. 
And lots of crinoids. Lots of crinoids. Which, you know, from the ecologist's point of view, is really interesting. Is what is it about this flank here that it makes it good for crinoid life and bad for coral life? Um, and apparently brittle stars, too, since that poor little guy didn't have a home. Potentially. Um, let's see that. My uh, aft cam there. So, uh, oh, yeah. I know what it's. Ha I know what's happening. Yeah. Never mind. It's not your aft cam. It's just all your lights. Cause we're. Uh <laughs> so Dan, a few minutes ago, so, uh, I saw what looked like a reflection of the tether and Atalanta's top hemisphere. Is that? Is that some? Do you sometimes catch a reflection up there of the tether? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay. I first saw that, and I was like, oh, dear. And then I was like, wait, that doesn't make sense for where it is. We're, uh, we have the currents kind of favorable here. It's taking it off to yeah. the uh, Atlantis to the south of us there. And that's what caught my attention was it was off to the south in good position, and then I suddenly saw it up on the right top, and I was like, <laughs> it triggered my you know, immediate response system. There goes some kind of fish. Is that another uh, Cuskiel? What is it? Cuskiel, yes. It could be. Push in there a yes. bit, Daryl. It could also be a snailfish. Maybe push in a little more. Oh, oh. It looks like a tadpole. It's very aggressive. I'm thinking Cuskiel. Yes. yes. We saw one on the earlier ship. That's a Cuskiel. Ophidiidae. Oh, that poor friend has a mean mug. He looks like something ancient, something that we would find out of the fossil records, like um, a placoderm almost. So speaking of ancient fossils, uh, the question earlier was, do you think that we're still able to find so many of these ancient creatures, I guess, uh, things that we were only seeing in the fossil record because it takes so long for or slower breeding because it'll take you know so sometimes an octopus will take six years to brood their eggs in the deep sea sure so um i don't think we have any definitive answer to that question um conjecture includes long generation time certainly because you just have fewer generations in which evolution can um, act on uh, i've heard conjecture about it being colder and so literally molecular motion is reduced in colder environment reducing the likelihood of mutation and so you may literally have less mutants occurring in the deep sea for evolution to act on um, the ecosystem here is relatively stable um, comparatively it still does change with global climate but it often changes a little bit slower than the surface waters or land um, and because it's more or less continuous I put a big asterisk on that. If we do mm -hmm. see biogeographic shifts, we do see or, you know, can tell there are different water masses that are hostile to some life and not others. Um, but as the climate shifts on a global scale, you're more likely to be able to get from a relatively, you know, good part of the ocean to a, maybe a better part in the deep sea than you are, say, being in North America and it becoming not favorable for whatever your environmental needs are getting to Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole host of potential reasons on why the deep sea is kind of this arc of biodiversity and uh, pre preserving uh, some of these extremely old um, taxa in relatively unchanged. But we certainly don't know definitively because without 100 million years to run an experiment, we really <laughs> can't uh, do any good hypothesis testing science on that one. And I'm still checking every crinoid for the vampire snail. I don't know what its true name is, but that's what it's saved as in my brain. So Corley, we had a geology question for you, which is why are there some holes in the rocks? Um, hmm. I think they mean like, see how it looks like a shadow, like a little hole or a little cave going in. Like here. Oh, oh. oh. 
Yeah, I think that mostly has to do with the original flow of the lava. Mm -hmm. So we're on a seamount, and generally when we think of seamounts, uh, we think of them as these uh, volcanic, underwater volcanic mountains. Um, so these were all created from magma, essentially. And uh, because of that, the lava flow is just going to look different. Um, so I think there are a lot of times you'll see lava tubes and stuff like that where lava will come out and it'll be instantly cooled. So you'll get this cold shell and then lava will continue to flow underneath it and create these tubes. Um, so that's kind of the holy texture. That's what I would attribute it to. And then the ferromanganese crust just kind of grows on top of that and might, you know, it's, it grows in like, it grows in relation to what the water is touching. So maybe it might kind of uh, highlight or exaggerate those holes a little bit more. That's a great explanation. Thank you. Elena is at Max Iris. Sorry, I missed that. What was it? Elena's at Max Iris. Right. So Dan, talk can, uh, oh. You can turn your lights back on now. So That'll help Daryl out a bit. So you won't have to max Iris. So speaking of lights, I know Hercules just had a major facelift. Dan, would you be able to tell us a little bit about Hercules' uh, overhaul, facelift, upgrades? Uh, yeah, basically we swapped the frame out. We built a new frame and, uh, what's happening? Am I pulling you? You're coming up too much? Uh, we, we, um, the frame, the old frame was, what, two decades old? So that's a really good run for an ROV frame. And, uh, same with the, uh, syntactic foam on the vehicle or the buoyancy. And so we, uh, Herc is uh, sporting, uh, it's basically the same frame, but we made a few modifications. Notably the uh, the brow or the bumper looks mm -hmm. quite different. Uh, Hercules was originally designed for archeology span uh, on shipwrecks. So it had kind of a specialized uh, bumper bar or brow. And uh, this one allows us to put more <coughs> uh, jewelry, as we call it, more shiny things <laughs> in the uh, in the bumper. So we have a couple more cameras up there, more lights. Uh, one of the other changes we did was uh, to the porch assembly, which you can see in between Ren and I here. It uh, is bigger than it was before, and it's also separate from the front bio box. So it can extend and retract independently of the bio box before when we open the bio box the porch would also extend and uh, yeah that's pretty much that's the highlights we spent um oh, four weeks four to six weeks uh, there was kind of a crew of us rotating out um and uh, University of Hawaii Marine Center was very kind and um, let us basically take over the place. Uh, one of their high bays there in the machine shop. So we brought the new frame in and parked uh, parked old Herc, as we're calling it now, <laughs> and started taking it apart. And we took everything off of it, literally. Uh, all the hydraulic lines, all the cables, connectors, all the ancillary equipment. There's a little coral right here, Dan. Just move it off to the left. And it's right. 
Can I? How do you see those things? Yeah, I'm pulling on you. You can turn off your auto heading there. I'll get back in the box. I have tried it. Okay, Daryl, push in there for us. Little coral here. Looks like probably another little bamboo. With a smaller crinoid in the foreground. Yep, see that? You can see one, two black bands kind of on the base of the stalk before we get into the fleshy polyps. Bamboos are also known for having these kind of really okay. thick fleshy pop, um, polyps as well. Um, these are also known for being extremely mucousy. When you bring these up to the Come surface, down, uh, they can meters. produce a massive amount of snot. Copy that, Ren. Down three, please. All right, science is good here whenever you are. Roger. Yes, please, yeah. What uh, is that little white bubble? Go ahead and push in the left some more side. there, Daryl. I'm not entirely sure. Ooh. Is that full zoom, is it? Full Look zoom. Okay, you can go white. So last night we were talking about coral avores, and we were looking at the jellyfish that can eat the polyps off of the coral. And one of the things that I learned was there's some coral avores that just eat the mucus, yeah, right. right? The mucus coming Let's off the I coral. Can. Yep, in, in shallow water, certainly. We don't have a, a good enough understanding of here, but deep sea coral avores yet to know if that is repeated down here. I'm uh, out of the box here, Brian. I'm going to turn and burn here to the north just a little bit. So Just let me know when you're back to right, in a, having a happy place. We're in uh, single digits here, which is where I get the nickname. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ren, Ren, you can come up a little bit now, please. Delta Dan flies again. Yeah, we uh, typically like to maintain at least double digits for the Delta of uh, Atlanta above Herc, but um, sometimes we uh, push the envelope a little to get the shot. Is my, uh, how's our DVL versus? Yeah, we are. Okay, uh, see, are you looking up the hill now, Ren? Oh, we had an... This looks like a very interesting area. Yeah, I was going to say, Corley, can you tell us what, from your geology point of view, yeah, what are you seeing when you look at this? Spin back around there. I mean, I know that there's a bunch of people who are interested in some angular rocks. Um, turn to um, take my to the wrap out. Looks, looks way like that a is. great spot for some of those. <laughs> so what? angular is a is another geology term <laughs> <laughs> that we use to describe the shape of rocks. So you can either have angular or clockwise. rounded. Um, angular is kind of what it. They kind, of <laughs> they're kind of self-explanatory. Kind of self self. um, uh, faster, faster. But as opposed to, you know, more rounded edges, yep. um, they're, you know, more angled. <laughs> In terms of sedimentary rocks, um, more, like Before a more rounded that, rock. Before get started, if you get in a happy place, we may want to look for a rock here with all this um, rock jumble. Uh, a more rounded rock might mean uh, that it's up, more weathered, it's older, mm -hmm. it's been through more stuff. A more angular rock might mean um, that it's newer. So looking, I know we're kind of on the side of a geo or a flat top seamount. Would some of this rock be like the weathered rock or from the original lava flow? Um, I mean, I think most of this is, I guess it's kind of... Hmm. I'll answer it in like two parts. So I think all of this would be my assumption, unless something yeah, was iris just a bit broken there. from above up, and right? kind of Keep tumbled down. Um, I would say it would probably be, and the lava flow, it's kind of hard to say the original lava flow mm -hmm. because there's many different lava flows that'll happen that create a seamount. You know, seamounts are created over millions it's and millions of years. About, uh, um, 
So right that's one thing. But um, yeah, as time goes on, especially these volcanoes that are underwater, they are submerged, uh, they're gonna get weathered. Um, that's just a fact of being in the ocean. Um, I hope that answered your no, question. No, that 100% did. Come up. So I know one of the focus of this expedition is to learn more about the geology of this area. Mm -hmm. And so they believe that this area was made 80, 86 to 81 million years ago. Yeah, so we're expecting this whole area, we say it's from the Cretaceous, which is this large geologic period. But, and that's when the dinosaurs were still walking around, right? Yeah. Uh, contrary to popular belief, uh, Jurassic Park okay. was not... <laughs> it was in the Cretaceous. Yeah, it, was, it was wrong. <laughs> but uh, Cretaceous Park doesn't have the same ring. So I guess I understand why they took those liberties. Oh, that's quite the change in the shape of these rocks. Yeah. So would, would this be what you would call pillow basalts? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, pillow basalts are these really kind of lobey, pillowy. Can you make a note uh, when you get a chance? Flows. That uh, tilt down is too I mean, slow. look at them. Don't you just want to take a nap right on one of them? <laughs> <laughs> so comfortable. OK, you're good there for a minute. Um, but yeah, as I was saying before about the lava tubes, it's kind of a similar thing where you have hot magma. Just it's coming out. out. Bit, no. um, you have very, very cold water. It's going to, we say, quench. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll quench on the outside, which just means it cools instantaneously. So it turns into rock on the outside, but there's still magma flowing on the inside that creates these big pillows of um, basalt. That was a great explanation. Thank you. Here we're looking at another one of these bamboo, bamboo corals, corals we've seen several times. Okay, can go away. Sorry, we kind of blew by the uh, steep part there where we caught us at a not take, opportunity. If you're in a good spot here, can we look at these two corals right here before you get too yep. far? Go ahead. We've yeah. got at least one, what we're generally referred to as a bottle brush chrysogorgia here on the right with brittle uh, star. a brittle star. Oh, and he's also, or oh. they're also waving hello. And oh, no. Abandon ship. <laughs> <laughs> Find a new home. Still seeing what looks like might be a squat lobster in there. I can't get a look at him, but I can almost guarantee you it's a, one of these Europtychus squat lobsters, at least one, maybe a shrimp too in there. Okay, push in a bit. All right, science is good with that one. Oh, we've got a little baby colophagus sponge in there too. Hi, little baby. Is that the thing? The, in the bottom, okay. kind of left. The so white? It, yep. Crusty looking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no! The what's the white? Okay, then what's the white crusty thing? Down at the bottom. That's not a barnacle. Oh. Okay. Oh. Okay, barnacles go, can be this uh, deep. White yep. a bit. We'll see a couple different the types there. of barnacles down here. Don't ask me to tell you what the different types are, but I know there are a couple of different ones. <laughs> go wide there. And then the gray mushroom thing was that single-celled organism, the single-celled amoeba again. Potentially, I missed it. Forget I have a down looking camera now. Okay, push in there. Yeah, there's one node there out on the left branch, so that's a bamboo, another sad looking bamboo coral. <laughs> and call this the, the wall of sad bamboos or something like that. The wall of sadness. All right. I'm good, thank you, sir. Okay, you can go white. I forgot all about that camera when I really needed it. <laughs> oh, can we take a look at this one there before sure. we fly too far? And if it's what I think it is, we may want to sample it if we, if you're in a position to do that. Right, it's can you video watch uh, get the ship to stop? video watch change this one here Brent yep okay Daryl go ahead <laughs> I'm 
Ah, oh, sorry, they're changing out there. I'll have to wait for a minute. Mm. No, we might get pulled here. You can maintain your heading. Sorry. <clears throat> Reach over there on that left gray box. Left one. Yeah, push the t joystick forward. And if you're going to run out of time here, Dan, it's not critical. Push it in a little more. Yeah, and then there's a slidey thing next to it that does the oh, focus. That is not here, what I, I thought that I can was. Happen, guys. So that is a bamboo. I thought it was the Chrysogorgia we've been seeing. So I don't want, don't need that one. Render. Thank you. Okay, you can go white. Do you want to start the ship moving again, or do you want to? No, let's uh, hold on here. Wow. We're getting into some dense uh, a lot of stuff areas, here. and I'm way outside of my box. So. Oh, what is that? That's a little swimming polychaete just kind of made a quick appearance. Ooh. We've got a glass sponge here in the frame. We've got this thin white coral, two of these thin white corals that I can't identify from out here. Any in particular you want to see? But yeah, if you've got time here, that one, please. Yeah, oh, we got, we should have time. That one looks different than the ones we've seen before. It does. You can uh, turn off your auto heading there and then click it off and on. Hey, it's Adam down in the lounge. Might get an eDNA sample here. Ooh, yeah. Ah, back off. What niskins are open? They're all open at the moment. Oh, nice. Come down uh, five meters, would you? I'm going to keep an eye on that delta there. <laughs> Uh, okay, Brian, sorry, which one were you? All right, first one is the one in the back. That one, please. Right, okay, Amber, go ahead and zoom in there, please. And for those of you watching at home, I have a telestrator where I can actually annotate the Hercules HD video from the front row to see, which is the first ship I've ever sailed on with it, and I have often oh, wow. thought it would be a wonderful addition, and right. Nautilus is the first one to put it on, and it is every bit as good as I was hoping it would be. <laughs> Keep an eye on the, see that red wall of death encroaching into your 20 meter uh, circle there. You can, you can actually tilt up your camera a little and <coughs> see the rocks before you hit it. Uh, and I may want to sample that one. So Sample the, sample sorry, the what? The one we're trying to look at. Um, when we get a zoom in on it, and then we're probably going to want to misc in here, so we're going to be here a minute. Roger. Hmm. Avoid hitting the wall? No. <coughs> um. Yeah, you're going to have to come up. Come up five. <coughs> Can we move the ship uh, 20 meters east? Or 20 meters on the reciprocal heading there. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to put the mouse here. We'll come back oh, here, wow. Brent. I, I gotta 
Yep, understood. Awesome. Uh, bridge nav. Uh, can we move two zero meters uh, at zero eight five degrees at point two knots, please? Uh, yes, 20 meters Roger. at uh, 085 degrees. So, for those of you who are watching at home, what we're doing right now Roger. is running a two body ROV system. Is uh, a, is a 085 degrees. Where you've got the ship moving, and you've got what Atalanta's doing moving, and then you've got where Hercules is moving. And Atalanta's position is controlled. Thank you. Totally by the position of the ship and the currents pushing on the wire connecting Atalanta to the ship. Um, and so when you maintain a couple, you know, a long distance move like we have been doing, some momentum builds up and the vehicles okay. actually start trailing try. behind the ship. And so even when the ship stops, the vehicles rock. keep swinging. Mm -hmm. So what happened here is no, nice and easy. I had nice a and easy. Bad, <laughs> bad courtesy to pick a coral right at the base of a rock that I wanted to look at when they had a little momentum up with Atalanta. So Atalanta is continuing to swing towards the right. uh, face of the rock. Um, even though Hercules can stop, Atalanta is going to keep moving. So we've got to back the ship up a little bit um, to get all three members of the dance into a sta uh, stable configuration so they can set Hercules down and break out the arms and do the sampling we want to do. Cool. Are we looking to collect samples in this area? Yep. There's a, yeah, a coral that is caught my attention. Um, and then we've got kind of the densest aggregation we've seen on this dive. So we're going to trip a NISC in here mm. for oh. eDNA analysis. Thank you um, for tuning in. For those who are just tuning in, we are currently exploring. Okay, you should be good just outside the Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll. Oh, for our viewers, um, what is eDNA? <laughs> Were you scared? <laughs> so eDNA is, um, it's a new Sorry. way of figuring out basically what's living okay, you can um, engage in and your around uh, a certain area, a certain uh, environment. So uh, in this case, in the deep sea, whenever something uh, swims around in a certain heading. area or um, it on the water it current again you know, in a certain current, there some part of their body sheds off like skin cells, um, you know, chitin, something like that, something containing their DNA. And then when you take a sample of the water, you can get pieces of that DNA still in the water that's in the form of we'll see like if we can marine Brian snow. And, find right. else to and then look we at. can look at that in the lab and see <laughs> what's around that area. And that's eDNA. Right? Has it been proven um, a, a successful sampling technique, or um, is it better to actually um, take the entire organism? Tilt itself? down just a little bit for me. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not too well versed in DNA, mm -hmm. but um, we it's take a really a look at that big sponge there. Ooh. Yeah, right. if you're safe Ooh. here. It's a really nice way of seeing generally what's in the community without um, like contamination or whatever right, because, right. Um, or you know, the struggle of getting a whole organism. Um, it's a yeah. Herc beauty shot yeah, too. Yeah, pretty good overall view of community composition. Awesome, thank you for explaining. Did I, I didn't hear her, is she, uh, she telling you she's zooming in? Roger, Roger. And just hold in nice and easy while I'm looking at the sponge Also, here. I forgot to mention that my name is Sarah. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in for Coralie as she's eating dinner. Do you, uh, yeah, if you hold in easy while I'm this close here, then we'll be able to do both. So this looks like a really big glass sponge. Mm -hmm. Roger. 
I cannot, I cannot hear video. Oh, I was being sneaky and talking to him. Directly. Now I can hear <laughs> uh, Tilt down for us. All right, I think I've got what I need from this, this sponge, but feel free to take a gander at whatever corals are in this area while you get happy with the ship's movement. Actually, the this thing in the bottom left. Right. It's going to take a while for the, well, first the ship has a move, of course, and Atlanta has a swing. Okay, if, you, if you don't want to be on the bottom right now, that's totally fine, too. No, no. Okay. I have to get physically yanked off the bottom to leave this. Okay. <laughs> um, this morning, it's going to take a while to get back yeah, to where and, we were. And I'm actually optimistic that that might be the same one I was looking at down there. We may not have to go back. That's what I'm hoping. Okay, Amber, you can push in there, please. Going to rotate around dangerously close to the sponge there. Okay, can push in a bit more for us. center of the camera. Yep, that's the, yeah, that's a Chrysler Gorgia. Yeah, if, if that's a place you can sample it, I Absolutely. love a clipping of it. What do we got left on that move? Uh, we we completed the move. The ship's holding steady here. Right. So this is a coral that I believe we have seen um, several times today. Mm -hmm. um, that we're not a hundred percent sure what it is. We were actually even struggling to get it to the family level. Um, okay, video go in. So we're going to take a small snip of it here so we can get it up under the microscope uh, and confirm because we've seen a lot of these throughout today. Um, and so we definitely want to make sure we oh. know what we're looking at. I'm just going to uh, reposition here away from the giant sponge. And um, <coughs> so I changed. Uh, wait till Amber sits down. Or Lynette. Sorry. Lynette, can we uh, can we get 20 meters west, please? Sorry, I'm being pushy on the uh, dinner changeout here. 20 meters west, please. down five and tilt up for us. <laughs> Keep an eye on that rock again. <clears throat> Have a hard shot. <clears throat> it's over there now. Amber, I'm going to turn on the pen and tilt light here. It might blow it out a bit. set up here you can uh, full zoom on the coral there right keep an eye on 
things for me. I tend to get distracted when I get my toys out here. Yeah, Chris, if you want to go ahead and hit the hit sample in situ button, this will be a good look for the target. Look at those polyps. Yeah, you do. We're trying to move the ship back, so it should Looks like there's get better. an associate on it as well. Yeah, you're right. <coughs> Maybe two. Um, Can't quite tell. You probably will have to come up, but you'll have to come up easy, easy, because I'm uh, perched on a marble there, as you see, on the porch. So if you pull too hard, you'll pull Herc off of it. So nice and slow. Do we know what species of coral this is? It's a uh, it's a family Chrysogorgiidae. I'm okay. fairly sure, um, but uh, come I'm just a little bit later. Take it to a genus, uh, the genus level, it's probably Chrysogorgia, but Thank I you. would I'm gonna refer okay, that to. Okay, if you hold, stop on the winch there for a second. Those people who spend more time arguing about what corals are named than I. Right. <laughs> How big a piece do you want, Brent? Seven to ten centimeters. Roger. Are we a little wider? No, I have another camera here. Okay. You want to just hit that bare spot there on the top of the arc would be perfect. Roger. Right about there somewhere. Sounds good. Looks good. With the associate. Um, is that an associate? What is that? It looks like it's a polychaete or something. It doesn't, it's not moving. I don't though. know. I mean, for a minute there, I thought it was an apocophron. Or maybe. But I'm used to them being maybe wrapped I'm around. The I don't know. I'm not sure I think either. the associate was a little bit farther down. Oh. No, he, what we're looking at definitely no, see, is in the claws. We just can't figure out what we're yeah, looking right at. Yeah, right over so there, Ren. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 head left a few degrees yeah. if you want. But I, oh. But I don't know. There is, there was a second one though, like a yellowish. Yeah, yeah, the yellowish one. Yeah. Um, where would you like to um, put this thing? I don't have a strong preference from the science side other than it's small, so I'd put in a smaller spot to leave us options, but I don't think we are where we have samples so far. Uh, the only box is in uh, the starboard bio box E. Okay, so, so pilot's choice, but I'd, if um, you don't mind, put it somewhere smaller since it's on the smaller side. Yeah, I'll put it in, uh, we've got some small boxes in the uh, starboard here. You can uh, zoom back in there if you want. Find it interesting, something to look at while I'm putting my prize away here. Uh, Ren, can you change from uh, port rail cam to starboard bio box, please? Also a really small, brittle star on that rock behind it. Can you use the telestrator to show us? Camera. It's not Dude. in frame yet. Cameras. Oh, never mind. <laughs> when it comes back. Oh, there we go. Not there, oh, I see it. Okay. Ren. <laughs> Ren. The power of the Hotel. Ring. Oh, so fun. My cameras. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, I'm still missing one there. <clears throat> That's what I want, maybe. <clears throat> All right, open the box. Roger. How we look at an Argus we hit, or Atlanta we hit in the rock shit. Um, sorry, I lost the plot on if there's any samples in any of these boxes. Uh, just in Biobox E. What's that? Biobox E is in Echo. I don't know which one E is. <laughs> That's the forward one. Uh, uh, the forward big one, sorry. I did. I'm going to go for the low-hanging fruit here in the sky in the 
our uh, letters are need a little love there. So Brian, you've had a couple of uh, people suggest names on the worms, and then somebody is saying that the coral is Ramla Gorgia militaris, which was reassigned from Plura Gorgia militaris in 2021. Uh, I will take their word for it. I know. I was I was thinking the same thing. When you start mentioning dates and reassignments, 100 percent. I think it's in the box. Okay, close the box, please. I think you need to winch out. <laughs> Roger. Uh, let me play around here for a minute. Right there, I, I got it. <coughs> then when you get a chance, you can put uh, Atlanta back up on the lower H11. <coughs> You're good if we could trip a Niskin as well. Oh, yeah, a Niskin. Uh, yeah. And if you can, stay kind of a little bit closer to the bottom into the other corals because we're trying to get a sense of the, the eDNA concentration close to this little crop of corals. Right here. Let me, uh, up. Come up, Brent. Come up. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're good. You're good. Sorry. That was a... You're, well, I just saw a little nosedive there and panicked. <coughs> I forgot. Sorry, I forgot about the Niski. Uh, what was the sample number for the uh, Chrysler Origin? Um, zero, one, two. All right, great. Sample zero one two was the Chrysogorgia, and the Niskin will be zero one. Um, if you uh, okay. on your uh, destination there, H one one, and then the source should be uh, Sled Zeus or whatever, Sled HD, something like that. That's the baby. Thank you. So can you tell, um, what's the purpose of the Niskin bottle down here? And you said eDNA. So we're using the Niskin to collect eDNA? Yeah. Yeah, well, it stands for environmental DNA. Um, and then I'm going to say something, and then uh, Brian's going to help me out afterwards. <laughs> um, but essentially, what I understand it as as there's DNA, uh, any sort of sea creature that's moving through the area. So you, um, we only see the these certain cans? sea creatures, corals and things here, but there can be a lot of other biodiversity uh, that we don't know about. Uh, but they'll leave little traces of their DNA in the water column. So when we take a okay, Niskim sample, we um, we're essentially looking for the DNA of all these other types of species that we don't see. Um, and it kind of helps give us an estimate of how biodiverse the area is. Um, and then I think there's a big um, database, I think, that they're trying to collect for eDNA. We're trying to build the database. Oh, uh, yeah. Not we as in the royal we, not as in me, but. Um, Roger, that last one was 013. <laughs> No, I think your, your explanation is dead on. So what we kind of the reason we turn it here is we've got a little bit of a cluster of life. We've got a bottle brush Chrysogorgia over here. We've got uh, potentially a formerly known as Pleurogorgia that we just sampled. Another Chrysogorgia bottle brush and a, a very large uh, glass sponge here. So this is 
this in the spot we saw 10 meters or so down slope uh, it's been the highest kind of concentration of life we've seen here so far so we wanted to trip that bottle uh, and then collaborators at the Pacific North Northwest Pacific Fisheries Science Center uh, and Boston University um, will do some really fancy genetics and bioinformatics on the sample after it's filtered uh, to see if they can detect all of those corals I just listed and what else they can detect uh, in just DNA fragments floating in the water. That was great explanations, thank you. All right, thank you pilots for all that work. I think we are good in this location. Roger. Off we go. So Dan, I noticed that that was a lot of fancy maneuvering. Mm -hmm. And you were... Let me come on the other side of uh, Atlanta there, or at least get under it. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut nope, you out there. Nope, that's 100% okay. Where's but you were doing all kinds of fancy maneuvering. How long did it take you to become so proficient at, at all this. <laughs> I'm still waiting for that to happen. <laughs> this one, I think I, uh, I'm decent at operating these vehicles. I usually get reminded that <clears throat> I'm not. But uh, typically, so <laughs> in the commercial world, um, they have a whole schema of that, so they go by competencies, and that's basically uh, hours, operational hours. So mm -hmm. uh, we average probably 500 hours, 500 to 1,000 hours a year. Wow. Uh, that's so you that's spend, a good uh, career path then. If you spend 180 days a year offshore and you work a 12-hour watch, uh, you do the math. We do 12-hour uh, shifts, usually. Mm -hmm. But For example, here on Nautilus, we're doing two um, four-hour watches, so you're not in the van all the time. Uh, you can tilt up just a bit for me. Is there a reason why Nautilus does four-hour watches instead of 12 hours? They're crazy. Because <laughs> 12-hour watches are miserable. Yeah, it's a matter of... Uh, it's an ongoing debate, but they can be... Um, so it's a nautical thing. Um, it depends on the personnel that you have. For example, if there was, um, you know, three experienced um, ROV operators, then during a typical 12-hour uh, shift, you would have, um, you know, it only takes two of us to operate the uh, the vehicle. The third person would be <coughs> rotating in and out working in the shop, repairing stuff, mm -hmm. inventory, tidying, all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Um, but and there's here, so here much that goes on behind the scenes. Y'all guys are constantly at it. You can come up a bit, Ren. Here, here on Nautilus, uh, because it's uh, a training vessel, we have, you know, half the people in this room, this is their, uh, well, for Ren, this is his second time in the chair. He's doing awesome. Uh, but four hours is all I can take. <laughs> four hours is all I can take. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ren, if I know you were busy learning and training. Would you like to say anything about your experience so far? Since this is your second time in the chair, second time captaining an ROV, and here you are doing it at Atlanta. Captaining might be a strong word. <laughs> piloting, sorry, piloting. But, uh, that's a lot of fun. Well, Dan, while you're waiting for the zoom, uh, ship to start moving, can we take a quick zoom on that? Just, sure. to, just quick. Sorry, I was waiting for a message. Go ahead there. It's, it's fun, a lot of moving parts, a lot to keep track of. But I've got a good teacher and I'm uh, learning a lot. So is this something that you see yourself pursuing? I know you are a student or er, a master student over at Carnegie Mellon right now. Uh, yeah, that's correct on both accounts. Working with ROVs is 
definitely something I want to be doing for a long time. So I'm thrilled to be here and learning this, learning this trade, learning these practical skills. I can uh, go tight. Well, maybe not my stable. Touching the rock somewhere. Uh, let me swing her around a little. Come on, Herc. Okay, you can push in a little harder there. We're a max zoom. Right. You can ask me. Not quite focused. There you go. Just going to get a 50-50. <coughs> yeah, so now there's no more biologists in the background. Uh-oh. <laughs> so I think that means we can just call everything what we what we want or what we think. <laughs> what we feel. Fun names. I love when they zoom in on the rocks and then by chance they get some biology in the image like that. <laughs> Okay, you all happy with that back there? Yeah, we're good. Here we go. Okay, Daryl, go wide, please. <laughs> Copy that. Above my pay grade, but you know, I'm always up for a mountain climb. Um, we have uh, some real steep terrain uh, to the north. What are the rings on that sonar display?